I'm glad that you're here to worship with us today, and we are going to look at our second segment in our sermon series for this month entitled, What We Need. And if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open them with me to the book of Luke, chapter 11, where we are going to take a look at a prayer that is from a different perspective from the gospel writer of Luke. So if you have your Bibles, open them with me to the book of Luke, chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. If you don't have your Bibles, we did some effort for you, and it's on the screen. But this morning, I'll be reading from the New International Version in Luke, chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. The Bible reads in Luke, chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. If you're there, say amen. Amen. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Verse 2, he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Verse 5, then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. Verse 7, and suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Verse 9. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will you give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This morning I want to talk to you under the subtopic, the audacity to ask the audacity to ask. Let's pray one more time. Father in heaven, we have just read your word, and now we ask for a special outpouring of your spirit once again on the preaching of your word. That as we bring with us the distractions of this week, Holy Spirit, you would lay them aside, and that our eyes and our hearts would be fixed upon you, and that when we leave here today, Lord, we would be closer to our Father in heaven. This is what I ask, and this is what I beg of you. In the mighty name of Jesus, let all God's children say, Amen. Amen. So, this last Thursday, just a couple days ago, I had the opportunity to celebrate a a milestone in my marriage. Uh, It was our 11-year anniversary this Thursday. When my wife and I got married, um, we would often kind of make jokes at each other because we got married rather young. Uh, She would say, as she married a 23-year-old, I robbed the cradle. Can a picture a cradle, you know? She robbed the cradle that she married someone younger than her. Thank you, honey. (laughs) But in response, I would say to her and to everyone around, including the church, I robbed the nursing home. (laughs) It's a miracle that we're still married. (laughs) Uh, And over the course of time, as we've gotten to know each other, I can tell you that marrying a younger man has been difficult for her because women are more emotionally mature than men. That's just a matter of fact. And when you have a spouse who's a few years older and you are already younger, it causes some difficulty. one day I was sitting at my couch at home when we were you know, living together and, and married, 
And she came home into the house as I'm sitting there on the couch, either reading a book or looking at my cell phone. And uh, she looked discouraged this day compared to any other day. And I noticed the countenance on her face was a little bit sadder than usual. And so I said to her, honey, is everything okay? And as I'm sitting on the couch, I want you to picture the scene of my house there, that my shoes for the entire week had been displaced all over the living room floor, <laughs> and that my jacket and my clothes were hanging over couches and chairs in the kitchen. And behind me, as I'm looking at her eagerly in her eyes, telling her, you know, what's wrong? There's a stack of dishes in the kitchen that you can see uh, taking up over all of the kitchen. And she looked at me and she said, I'm fine. <laughs> and if I've learned anything in marriage, when you're fine, it's not fine. <laughs> and I said, what can I do to help? What's going on? She said, I shouldn't have to ask. It's obvious. And I tell you what, it probably took me 10 years <laughs> to realize that cleaning the kitchen is saying I love you more than flowers and roses and rainbows. Do you hear that? <laughs> uh, you, you know, in, in marriage and in any relationship we have in life, uh, it makes sense that we need to communicate our needs to one another. Uh, psychologists, they call it uh, MRE. Some of us have MRE, mind reading expectations, that we expect other people to know what we want without asking them. And so as we look throughout our life, we have to realize, no, we have to verbalize what we need to our spouse, to our mechanics, to our doctor. They don't know what's going on inside of our head and our heart. But as we think of the scriptures this morning, there is one person who does know everything that we need. There is one person who already has exactly in his mind what it is we would already ask before we ask him. The Bible tells us in Isaiah that God knows the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet. Psalms 139 tells us that before there is a word on your mouth, the Lord knows it already before it comes out. And yet our passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 11 calls us to have the audacity to ask God for our needs. And I wonder, as we examine the passage of Scripture this morning, why? Why does God ask us to request our needs from Him when He already knows? Why do we ask God for anything when He already knows everything. The Bible tells us that Jesus is in a certain place praying. And we know from our passage last week, he had just left the house of Martha and Mary, and so he's on the Mount of Olives, and Bible scholars believe that Jesus made a habit of playing in a, praying in a certain place called the Garden of Gethsemane. If you can picture a big, large hill, down that hill, was a garden by, in the, by the name of Garden of Gethsemane. And it was an agricultural garden where they produced olive oil. And Jesus was there praying. And as he was praying, his disciples were watching him. And when he finished praying, his disciples asked him a question. Jesus, teach us to pray the way John taught his disciples to pray. There must have been something different about Jesus when he went to prayer and when he left prayer. There must have been a countenance change from being concerned and worried before he prayed and then what changed after he prayed. And I can't help but be reminded this morning that if God in the flesh needed to spend time in prayer, how much more do we mortals need to pray? And his disciples asked him, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to have that relationship with God that you have. 
But they add a caveat to it. They say, teach us to pray the way John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. Uh, see, in Jesus' time, the, the religious leaders would have a prayer chant the way that we in our day in athletics have a sport chant. I don't know if you've ever gone to the uh, Baltimore Orioles and gone out to a baseball game, but whenever the game is getting really, really exciting, the crowd begins to chant. Does anyone know the chant? Let's go. You guys aren't baseball fans. <laughs> Let's go O's. Let's go O's. If you've been to a basketball game and you're in the fourth quarter and the time is running out and the game is close and you're for the home team, the whole crowd will chant when the other team has the ball, defense, defense. You see, it's a way to build a community of individuals and make them one body together. So that after a team loses, we can say when we leave the Baltimore Orioles or the Washington Wizards, who always lose, <laughs> we can say, oh, we lost. We're a community, collective identity. And so when Jesus' disciples are asking him, teach us to pray, they're asking for more than a personal relationship with Jesus. They're asking for Jesus to give them a corporate identity as followers of Christ. And so when we ask the question, why do we need to ask God for anything when he already knows everything, one of the responses we get from the pages of Scripture this morning is that as we pray as a community together, we begin to get a collective identity. That we are no longer a half Italian, half Filipino from Canada, but we are a church family together. We're no longer doctors and lawyers and professionals. We are for, first and foremost a people who follow Jesus. And so as we look at our passage this morning, Jesus helps us know that praying to God gives us a self-awareness of who we are as individuals and as a group of people. And then Jesus gives us the model prayer of how to pray. And in Luke, it's a shorter version than in Matthew. Jesus tells his disciples to refer to God as Father and then ask for our physical needs and then for spiritual needs, our daily bread, and then the forgiveness of our sins. And one of the things I love about this passage and this uh, teaching on prayer is that it helps us not only to be aware of ourselves and our own identity, but as we ask God for anything, even though he already knows everything, we become more aware of our own needs as people we begin to be more attuned to the Spirit of God and what he shows us is our need. If you go to a mirror, you can see if there's something on your face. If you go to your friends, they can tell you, yeah, okay, your personality is a little prickly in certain areas. But when you go to God in prayer, when you open the pages of Scripture, he, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he cuts into the intentions and the thoughts of your heart, Hebrews says. And he's able for you to see the very core of who you are. And so as we pray, we're made aware of our needs that we're not even aware of. But one of the things about the model prayer I want you to notice is that Jesus never instructs his people to pray I or me, but always our and we. Jesus never teaches us to pray I and me, but our and we, always in the plural. And what this teaches us is that as we pray to Jesus, as we ask the Holy Spirit to come into our life, he not only helps us to be more aware of our own individual needs, but to the needs of those around us as a community inside of these walls and outside of these walls. You know, one of the things I love about this church, which is special among Seventh-day Adventist churches, is that we don't just talk the talk here, we walk the walk. One-to-one -one ministry goes out every single month to help those in the city of Baltimore who do not have food and clothing. 
Every single day we have our Urban Life Center and our director who is here with us this Sabbath who spends 40 hours a week helping the physical, emotional, mental, and educational needs in the city of Baltimore. Because we know, as Jesus taught us in prayer, before we get to someone's spiritual need, we have to first address their physical need. How ridiculous of a notion would it be to try to give someone without food and clothing a Bible when they're naked and hungry? And so the Bible teaches us that as we pray, as we become more in tune with our own needs, the Holy Spirit helps us to be more in tune with the needs of other people all around us. Why ask God for anything when he already knows everything? Because as you pray, God gives you this perspective that comes from him to see your life and the life of those around you through different lenses. And you're able to see what you really need compared to what you want. And you're able to see the needs of those around us with clarity. The Bible continues and it teaches us that not only do we pray, when we pray, do we understand our own needs and the needs of those around us, but as we pray, we get to understand who it is we are praying to even more. In verse 2, Jesus tells us to call God Father. And this is special. I know we've heard it our whole life growing up, but all throughout the Old Testament, God is referred to as many names. Adonai, Elohim, uh, Yahweh, El Shaddai, so many different names, but never in the Old Testament is God referred to as Father in prayer. And yet Jesus comes along and he says, I want your relationship with God to change, how you view God to shift. He's not someone who created the world and left it ticking as he went off on vacation. You have a God who is a Father, who wants to have an intimacy with you, who stands in heaven and who is holy that as you talk to your Father, you can come to Him boldly because He loves you and cares for you. Our Bible tells us that God is not someone distant and far away, but He wants to be close to you every single day. And I wonder this afternoon as you're joining us here for service, how far are you away from your Father? Have you walked too far away from Him? He's calling you to come home. He's calling you to approach him in prayer. He's calling you to speak to him like you can speak to your own family member. God loves you and he wants you to come home. The Bible continues and it tells us a little bit more about who our Father in heaven is and what he's like. There's this funny story in verse 5 that it's hard to see the humor of it in our custom, but it's quite uh, funny from their custom. Um, Jesus tells this story about a man who comes to his friend in the middle of the night. And he says to him, hey, uh, I need three loaves of bread to entertain my guest. And the man in the story says, well, that's not going to happen. My kids and I are sleeping in our house. You know, leave me alone. But some of the humor and urgency of this story is that in Jesus' custom and Jesus' day, when you invited someone over into your home uh, or a guest stopped by, if you brought them into your home and you didn't have food for them, it would be a really shameful, dishonorable, and disrespectful thing to do to your guest. I try to think of a way to help us understand in our day and age what it would be like. Uh, the best I could come up with is imagine if you invited a group of people over to your home to have a wonderful meal. And then, one of your guests needed to go to the washroom. And you said, here, friend, come into the washroom. And they walked into the washroom, they opened the door, and as they looked into the washroom, they noticed there was no toilet paper, there was no soap, and they had to go and do their business in the washroom with either of those things. That's pretty bad, right? Now imagine if they came out, and then you, as a host, called them out on it. Hey, you didn't wash your hands. <laughs> that would be even worse, right? That would just be an obnoxious, shameful thing to do to your guests. 
That is the type of shame and dishonor that would happen in this story if this man can't get his friend some bread. But I want you to picture the story because we picture the story with, you know, a two-story house, four bedrooms ringing on the doorbell. That's not what the houses looked like in Jesus' time. It was a big box square with one room. And this Bible story tells us very quickly that the man who had the bread had children. So it's the middle of the night. Him and his family are sleeping in one room together. And he gets, he gets a knock on his door. Give me some bread. And the man says, I'm not going to give you any bread, because in order for me to do that, I have to open my bolted door, swing open the door wide open, and wake up my entire family and my sleeping children in order to give you the bread. And so he says, hey, get away from me. But Jesus says, if that man has the audacity or that shameless boldness to ask his friend to do something like that in the middle of the night, and even that friend will give him the bread, how much more do we serve a God who is not reluctant to give us good things, but is happy because he loves us to give us anything we ask? To have the audacity to ask God for what we need because unlike a friend who would reluctantly open the door in the middle of the night, God is a loving Father who is available to you 24-7. And he wants to be there to help you with every single one of your needs. You know, some of us have the wrong picture of God. We think that God requires us to ask him of things in order to kind of beg our way into the blessings of God. I want to try something to kind of illustrate what, what I'm talking about. Is there anyone uh, who is from the ages of 10 to 12 who can be an example for me this morning, and at the end of it, you will get some chocolate? 10 to 12. Come on up. Come on up, little, little man. Sometimes we have the wrong idea or vision of what the Father looks like. And so when we think of prayer, some of us think of God like this. Would you like some candy? I guess. Okay, here you go. <laughs> Keep asking. Can I have some? Yeah, sure, of course. Can I have some? Of course you may. Keep asking. Can I have some? Kim, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Keep asking. Some of us have a picture of God like this. That he's playing with us. That he's wanting to give us candy. But we got to really, really beg for it. We got to persist. We got to pursue. Would you like some candy? Yes. Come on, here it is. Oh, God. Oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> Let's give this round, kid a round of applause. Stay up. Stay up here. When the truth is, God is not wanting us to persist in prayer or have the audacity to ask because he doesn't want to give it to us. He wants us to pray so that we can get to know him as our father better. Amen. And so ask the question again. Would you like some candy? Would you like some candy? No, no, ask me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Would you like some more candy? Yes. And when we ask, we don't have to beg, we don't have to plea, but God is willing to give us so much more than we are willing to ask for. Here you go, bud. Share with your friends and ask your parents. Go ahead, take a seat. You know, in our passage of Scripture this morning, from verse 1 to verse 13, the word ask is there five times. The word give is there nine times. The word ask is five times. The word give is nine times. And it teaches us this valuable lesson about our Father. He is far more willing to give than we are willing to ask. And so he asks us to have the audacity to ask, not because he wants to string us along. <laughs> That's twisted of me, eh? <laughs> but because he loves us so much and he wants to give us good things. Our passage of Scripture answers the question, why ask God for anything when he already knows everything 
because number one, we learn more about who we are and our needs and the needs of the community. And number two, we learn more about our Father in heaven who loves us, who wants to give you so much more than you're willing to ask for. But as we study the passage of Scripture, there's one other beautiful message in this passage that teaches us why God wants us to ask. Uh, in this story, there is transitions that take place that I want you to notice. Jesus tells us to ask, and then seek, and then knock. There's a progression from being further away to closer, from asking to seeking to touching, from talking to looking to touching. That's one transition. In the next part of the passage, we see a different type of shift. Jesus is illustrated as a friend who would give a piece of bread to someone in the middle of the night. But then Jesus shifts his story about his father from a friend to a father. And he says, hey, if you need an egg, who's going to give you a scorpion? If you need a fish, who's going to give you a, who's going to give you a snake? There's a shift from friend to father, from distance to proximity to closeness. Even in the beginning of our passage this morning, we see that God is asking us to begin with our basic needs, with our bread that we need every day, from the forgiveness of sins we need every day. But he ends with the greatest gift that God wants to give us in verse 13, which is the Holy Spirit. So I want you to notice there's this transition taking place, there's this change taking place over the course of prayer. What I would call a shift in our relationship with God from a transactional relationship to a transformational relationship. From going to God for what he can provide for us to going to God for who he is as a person. There is this movement that God is wanting to take us on when we ask God for things in our life. To change our view of God from just being a person we go to when we need things to a God who we go to because we love him for who he is. In fact, in Acts chapter 1, we see this illustrated really clearly. The disciples see Jesus resurrected, and they ask him as he's resurrected in, in Acts chapter 1, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to us? Are you going to give us the kingdom? Are you going to give us the stuff? And Jesus says, wait, you don't get it yet. Wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you will receive power to be my witnesses. The disciples, they wanted his provision. They didn't care about his presence. They wanted his stuff, but they didn't want their Savior. And so as we pray, as we talk to God about things in our life, there is a transition that happens. There is a miracle that happens. There is a movement that happens. That we go to God not only for what we need, but for who God is. Some of us are still treating God like a vending machine. That if we push the right buttons in just the right way, we're going to get what we want. Some of us treat God like Santa Claus. That if we're, not, if we're nice at the end of the year, he'll bless us. When the truth is, God is wanting us to talk to him, not only for what he can provide for you, but because he wants you to love him as a person. I'm going to end with this... Uh, uh, silly uh, personal story that I got permission from my kids to share. Um, my wife uh, is a beautiful woman who lets me sleep in on Sunday mornings. Uh, always has, even though she wakes up at 5 o'clock every day um, to get to work. And one Sunday morning I was in Lacombe up in Canada, and I was sleeping in one Sunday morning, and uh, one of my babies started to pull on my body as I was sleeping. You know, they started to yank at me. And they would say to me, they would say to me, Wook Daddy, Wook Daddy. And I would ask him, I would say, uh, I would say to the, the, the young man, um, hey, sorry, give me, give me a second. I, I know we're on time. <laughs> he, would pull, he would pull on my, on my, on my finger, Wook Daddy, Wook. And I was groggy, I wasn't really able to pay attention. And I said, 
what's going on, buddy? Why are you waking me up? And he kept saying, look, Daddy, look. And that was his little kid way of saying, look, Daddy, look. And so I said, okay. And I, I let him pull me up, and I got up out of my bed, and I followed him. And guess where he took me to? He took me to the bathroom. And he said, look, Daddy, look. I said, what am I looking at? And as I looked into the bathroom, I saw my son doing something that his daddy likes to do. He was baptizing. <laughs> Except he was baptizing my non-waterproof iPhone 6 into the toilet. <laughs> look, daddy, look. You know, there are moments as a parent that you have to control and calm yourself lest you be taken to child services for doing things you regret. Uh, my wife and I were in the kitchen uh, not too long after that experience, and as we were just talking, we heard a flush coming from the bathroom. And then came out one of our little boys. Look, Daddy, look! And we're like, oh no, what is it? We go into the bathroom, we look into the toilet, and we see nothing. I'm like, oh no, what happened? Look, Daddy, look! And we look around, and we don't, it, we don't realize it right away. It takes us a few minutes. But we notice that our car keys are missing. <laughs> that the last set of our car keys have been flushed down the toilet. <laughs> Drives you crazy as a parent sometimes. <laughs> I praise the Lord they're grown up and well-behaved. They've repented and, and have been conform, re, renewed. <laughs> uh, but as I, as I talk to you about that story, I, I need you to, to get something. Because our kids, they can't do anything for us. They take our time. They take our money. They take our sleep. Sometimes they take our sanity. But there's no one on this planet who I love more besides my family and my children. Not because of anything they can do for me, but because of who they are as members of my family. And I want to encourage you to have the audacity, audacity to ask God for anything so that you can learn to develop that relationship with him, to love him the way he loves you. Not for what you can do for him, but for who you are. And I pray over this new year you begin to mature in your relationship with Christ, that you begin to love him, not for what he can provide for you, but for the person and God that he is. God bless you this morning.